uh, a lot of, uh, I think one chapter, we read one chapter two days ago. And uh, now we will do another chapter. How's everyone doing? Where are you guys from? Can you comment where you're from? Where are you joining from? And also, thank you for joining. We will wait for a few minutes and then we will start reading. Romania. Wow. That is so far. Thank you for joining. I think that's the first time I see someone from Romania from my chat uh, in my life. Ukraine, Libya. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Where else do we have? Thank you guys for joining. We have we have someone from Alexia, Alexia from Poland. So we have a lot of people from Europe. That is amazing. Europe and Africa. Ethiopia. Okay, okay. French. I am I am from France. French is the people. So you say I am French. From or you say so you say I am French or I am from France. France is the country. Libya. Okay, cool, cool. That is very cool. So we have a lot of people from the other side of the world. Anyone from Latin America? France. There you go. Very nice. Well, thank you guys for joining. The best way to start a new habit. We read this part. I think we did. Let me... No, actually, that's where we stopped. So, uh, nice. So we will, yeah, this is my favorite. This is my favorite chapter. If someone from Ecuador, wow, Mexico. What, what other country do we have? Do we have other countries. The thing I love about this book, by the way, the thing I love about this book is at the end of every chapter, at the end of at the end of every chapter, we will uh, there is a chapter summary. There's a chapter summary about that chapter. So like uh, if you forgot something that you read, whenever you read the summary, you um, you remember what you read. So like, Chapter summary for this previous chapter was uh, there are three levels of change. Outcome change, process change, and identity change. Identity change. So the most effective way to change your habits is to focus not on what you achieve, but on who you wish to become who you wish to become in the process. I love this. I love this. Say you want to lose weight. You want to be healthy. That should not be your goal, but who you want to be in the process, right? Changing your lifestyle, not just losing weight. I want to become a healthy person. Not that I want to lose 20 pounds, you know? Your identity, your identity emerges out of your habits. Every action is a vote for the type of, for the type of person you become, you wish to become. I love this. Becoming the best version of yourself requires you to continue continuously edit your beliefs. You cannot have a, a fixed belief. There are two different kinds of mindset, a fixed mindset, an open mind. So yeah, uh, so to upgrade and expand your identity. So you, you, should, you need to always be open-minded to change. The real reason habits matter is not because they can get you better results, but because they can change your beliefs about yourself. So, yeah. So that is the chapter summary for this chapter, guys. Uh, so do you guys want me to start?
I'm going to be starting shortly. Again, I am reading this book called Atomic, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits, Tiny Change, Remarkable Results. Small change, big results. Aren't you spoiling? What do you mean, aren't you spoiling? You mean like I'm spoiling the book? Because, well, I'm reading the book, so if that's what you mean. If you don't want to, if you want to read this book and you don't want to uh, be in the live, that is up to you. How much time does it take to read a book? It depends from one person to another. Because for me, I'm a slow re reader when I read something that I need to think about. Like for a book like this, I like to read slowly and take in the important information because speed doesn't matter. It's not a, you don't, you don't need to set a time on a book that you're reading. If it's, uh, if it's like something like this, because it's about how much you want to take, take away from the book, right? So I like to underline, I had to, I like to highlight, but for, for a novel or something that I just want to enjoy reading, you know, go through the story and what happens in the story for those, I read a little bit faster. So it depends. So you will see my speed as I start reading, uh, you will, you will know. So. Let's see. Uh, I want to see if this part was was interesting. A box of design like. Yeah, I already I already read this part. Okay, so this is one of my favorite things about habit. And I will start right here. Okay. Habits are mental shortcuts learned from experience. In a sense, a habit is just a memory of the steps you previously followed to solve the problem, to solve a problem in the past. Whenever the conditions are right, I'm going to put this in. Okay. Um, whenever the conditions are right, you can draw on this memory and automatically apply the same solution. The primary reason the brain remembers the past is to better predict what will work in the future. Habit formation is incredibly useful because the conscious mind is the bottleneck of the brain. It can only pay attention to one problem at a time. As a result, your brain is always working to preserve your conscious attention for whatever task is almost is most essential. Whenever possible, the conscious mind likes to pawn off, pawn off tasks to a non-conscious mind to do automatically. This is precisely what happens when a habit is formed. Habits reduce cognitive load and free up mental capacity so you can, uh, you can allocate your attention to other tasks. So what basically what this part means is habits, uh, we, habits are important to help you use less energy, right? That's why habits exist. And if you have good habits, you use less energy to complete complete that task that's why we have habits despite their efficiency some people still wonder about the benefits of habits the argument goes like this will habits make my life dull dull means uh no color no like meaningless and dark and boring i don't want to uh pigeonhole myself into a lifestyle i don't enjoy doesn't so much routine take away the vibrancy and spontaneity of life? Hardly. Such questions set up a false dichotomy. 
They make you think that you have to choose between building habits and attaining freedom. In reality, the two complement each other. The two complete each other. Habits do not... Habits do not restrict freedom. They create freedom. In fact, the people who don't have their habits handled are often the ones with the least amount of freedom. Do you guys agree with this part? I really love this part. You think if you don't have habits, you are free, but actually it's the opposite. Habits do not restrict freedom. They create freedom. Some people think that, think that if I build all these habits, then I will become like a robot and I will not have freedom. But I don't agree. Do you guys agree? What do you think? In fact, people who don't have their habits handled, they, people who don't have their habits under control, are often the, the people with the least amount of freedom. That means no habits, no freedom. Without good financial habits, you will always be struggling for the next dollar, right? If you don't have control over your money, you know, you just go out and buy shoes that you don't need or clothes that you don't need or spend 10 Fifteen dollars on coffee every day. That means you have bad financial habits, right? Without good health habits, you will always seem to be short on energy. Without good learning habits, you will always feel like you're behind the curve. You will. You're always being forced to make decisions about simple tasks. When. When should I work out? When should I work out? Where do I go to write? When do I pay the bills? Then you have less time for freedom. It's only by making the fundamentals of life easier that you can create the mental space needed for free thinking and creativity. Conversely, when you have your habits dialed in and the basics of life are handled and under control, your mind is free to focus on new challenges and master the next step set of problems. Building habits in, in the present allows you to do more of what you want in the future. I'm going to repeat this and I'm going to highlight it. Building habits, building habits in the present, building habits today allows you, will give you the opportunity to do more of what you want in the future. That means without habits, without building habits, you will not achieve what you want for your future. So... The science. All right. So this is how you can build a habit or this is how a habit works. Um, by the way, thank you guys for joining and thank you for sharing my live. Yeah. Hit that like and also share my life with your friends so that they can also join and benefit from my reading. So here. The science of how habits work, how, how habit works. The process of building a habit can be divided into four simple steps. Four simple steps. Cue, craving, response, reward. Cue, craving, response, reward. Do you guys know the meaning of these four words? Because if you don't know the meaning of these four words, it will be hard for you to understand how habit works. Do you know the meaning of cue? 
what is the meaning of Q? And uh, thank you for sending some bros. Uh, what is the meaning of Q? All right, I will, I will tell you. Q means signal or sign. Signal or sign, and I'll explain. For example, this is water, right? Mm -hmm. If I have my water with me, if I have my water right here, then that is the signal. I'm getting the signal that maybe I should drink water. I'm getting the signal. So that is the meaning of Q, a thing that triggers you. Very good, very good, very good, Hanu, Hany W0. Um, a Q is something that triggers you. So whenever I see the, I see the water, I get a trigger and maybe I'm thirsty. So immediately I go and drink. The thirst is the craving, the desire, right? Is the desire, desire. And what's response? Reaction. What do I do? I drink water, right? And what's the reward? The reward means the result your achievement or how you feel, right? Ah, I don't feel thirsty anymore. So Q, craving, response, reward. This is everything you need to know about habits. Four steps for good habits, bad habits, any kind of um, habit. For someone who smokes cigarette, who smokes? Who in the... Who in the chat smokes cigarettes? Those people who smoke cigarettes, they already have a habit of smoking. What would be the signal or what would be the thing that triggers them? Maybe a lighter. Maybe a lighter that's in their pocket. Or maybe they see the, the packet, like the cigarette packet on the table. Ooh, craving. Now they, they get the desire to smoke. And then what happens? The response. What's the response? Is the reaction. Taking action for, for what? For the habit. And you start smoking. Right? And what's the reward? Whatever feeling you get when you smoke. Personally, I don't smoke and I don't recommend it. It's a it's waste of money, waste of health. So, or some people have the, their cue is at whenever, like after they eat, then they get uh, the craving to smoke. So anyway, so the process of building a habit can be divided into four simple steps. Cue, craving, response, and reward. Breaking, breaking, breaking it down into these fundamental parts, these important parts can help us understand what a habit is, how it works, and how to improve it. So like I said, this is about everything, even your phone. For me personally, uh, I don't go on Instagram or Facebook or, or TikTok uh, on a regular basis. I only go on there to create content, to make videos. And I also have some pages. I follow some pages that are beneficial for me, but I do not have my notifications on. You know how you get a, you get a like on a post you made on Instagram and then immediately boop, you get a notification. That's terrible. That's very, very bad because you cannot focus on anything in your life. So that, but that would be the cue. And then what is the craving? Oh, I want to check. I want to see who texted me or I want to see 
what this person said. I want to see how many likes I have on my post. But the cue is the thing that triggers you. And then what's the response? You check your phone. And then two hours later, you're still scrolling, 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 scrolling on your phone. And then you get your reward, which is actually not reward. It's waste of time. So I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm always improving. But um, and I also have problem with like using my phone too much and all of that. It's very bad. But anyway, that is um, the most important thing about habit. Yo, I needed to, to see this. Well, thank you so much for joining. I am reading this book called Atomic Habits. It's about how to build habits and um, break bad ones. How to build good habits. I recognize this voice. Oh, really? Thank you for joining. So... So yeah, this four step pattern is the backbone of every habit and your brain runs through these steps in the same order each time. So it doesn't matter what habit you have, your brain goes through the same steps. Cue, craving, response, reward. It doesn't matter if it's about food, it's about a cheeseburger, eating a sandwich, eating a shawarma, um, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarette, going to the gym, doesn't matter. Good habits, bad habits, your brain goes through the same thing. Cue, craving, response, reward. First, there's a cue. First, there's a cue. The cue triggers your brain to initiate, to start, to start what? A behavior. To start a behavior. It's a bit of information that predicts a reward. Our prehistoric ancestors were paying attention to cues that signaled the location of primary rewards like food, water, and sex. Today, we spend most of our time learning cues that predict secondary rewards like money and fame, power, and status praise and approval, love and friendship, or a sense of personal satisfaction. Of course, these pursuits also indirectly improve odds of survival, reproduction, which is the deeper motive, motive, not motive, that's a different word, which is the deeper motive, the deeper push or motivation behind everything we do. Your mind is continuously analyzing your internal and external environment for hints, for signals of where rewards are located. Because the cue is first, is the first indication that we're close to a reward. It naturally leads to a craving, 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 craving. So the first step was what? The cue. And the second step is what? Is craving. They are the motivational force behind every habit. They are the motivational force behind every habit. The strong feeling and desire. Without some level of motivation or desire, without craving a change, we have no reason to act. So craving is not bad. Cravings are not bad. It's just Do you have cravings for bad things or good things? What do you, what you crave is not the habit itself, but the change in state it delivers. You do not crave smoking a cigarette. You crave the feeling of relief it provides. This is powerful, guys. I repeat, you do not crave smoking a cigarette. You crave the feeling of relief, of relaxation it provides, right? Whenever you're stressed, you're like, oh, I'm going to smoke a cigarette. And you smoke a cigarette, 
but you don't you you're really not craving the cigarette itself but because you think the the cigarette will help you with the feeling of stress do you guys agree Okay, some people agree. Do you always read books like this? Uh, if I do live, like I said, if it's a technical book that I, it's about uh, behavior or science and stuff like that, I take my time. If I'm on live, yes, on live, I try to explain to you guys because my page is for teaching English and motivating you guys to uh, have a better life. And it also helps me and motivates me to have a better life. Uh, so I do read it like this and thank you everybody for joining. What is the name of this book? It is called Atomic Habits, Atomic Habits. That's the name of this book. Thank you guys for your likes and for sharing my life, share my life with your friends so they can also benefit from my life. Anyway, not my live, uh, L-I-F-E, but my live, L-I-V-E. Okay. Anyway, uh, so you are not motivated by brushing your teeth. This is, I love this one too. You are not motivated by brushing your teeth, but rather by the feeling of a clean mouth. You know, like the fresh mint feeling after you brush your teeth? Ah, that is what motivates you. But you're not really motivated by cleaning your teeth, right? So... You do not want to turn on the television. You want to be entertained. You want to have fun. You want to enjoy the free time or whatever, right? So you want to be entertained. Every craving is linked with a desire, is linked to a desire to change your internal state. In internal state, your feeling inside, right? This is very, very important. So anything you do, you it's related to the desire for your internal state the change in your inner internal state this is an important point that we will discuss in detail later cravings are different from person to person cravings by the way defer it's the verb for different the adjective is different cravings differ from person to person in theory any piece of information could trigger a craving. But in practice, people are not motivated by the same cues. For a gambler, someone who gambles, the sound of slot machines. Slot machines are those machines that they have in those um, gambling, uh, like, uh, what is it? What are they called? Casinos. And they are a lot of slot machines. Ding, ding, they ding. So for a gambler, the sound of that can be a potent trigger that sparks an intense wave of desire. For someone who rarely gambles, hardly ever gambles, never gambles, the jingles and chimes of the casino are just background noise. They are just background noise. Cues are meaningless until they are interpreted interpreted it means until they are explained they are they have a meaning to you if they don't have a meaning to you they're not relevant to you they are meaningless the thoughts feelings and emotions of the observer are what transform a cue into a craving so the first part of the first part of a, of a habit formation is Q. The second is craving. The third one is what? Response. The response. What is the response? 
The response is the actual habit you perform. It the, is the actual habit you perform, which can take the form of a thought or an action. Whether, whether a response occurs depends on how motivated you are and how much friction is associated with the behavior. If a particular action requires more physical or mental effort than you are willing to expand, then you will not do it. Your response also depends on your ability. It sounds simple, but a habit can occur only if you are capable of doing it. I love this. A habit only occur. A habit only occur. Only occur. If you are capable, if you are able of doing it. If you want to dunk a basketball but can't jump high enough to reach the hoop, well, you are out of luck. Finally, the, the response delivers a reward. Rewards are the end goal of every habit. The cue is about noticing the reward. The craving is about wanting the reward. The response is about obtaining the reward. Getting that final feeling that you get, you want to receive. We chase rewards because they serve two purposes. So why are we chasing the rewards? They satisfied us, they satisfy us, number one, and two, they teach us, they teach us. The first purpose of rewards is to satisfy your craving. The first purpose of, your, of the rewards is to satisfy your craving, satisfy your strong desire. Yes, rewards provide benefits of their, of their, on their own. Food and water deliver the energy you need to survive. Getting a promotion brings more money and respect. And respect. Getting in shape improves your health and your dating prospects. But the more immediate believe benefit is the more immediate benefit is that rewards satisfy your craving to eat or to gain status or to win approval at least for a moment. Rewards deliver contentment and relieve from craving. Second, rewards teach us which actions are worth remembering in the future. Your brain is a reward detector. Your brain rewards, uh, detects rewards. As you go about your life, your sensory nervous system is continuously monitoring which actions satisfy your desires and deliver pleasure. Feelings of pleasure and disappointment are part of the feedback mechanism that helps your brain distinguish useful actions from useless ones. Rewards close the feedback loop and complete the habit cycle. If a behavior is insufficient, is not enough. If a behavior is not enough in any of the four stages, it will not become a habit. It will not become a habit. Eliminate the cue and your habit will never start. So if you don't have a cue, something that triggers you, you will never be able to build a habit. Reduce the craving and you will not Experience enough motivation to act. Make the behavior difficult and you will not be able to do it. And if the reward fails to satisfy your desire, then you will have no reason to do it again. So you do something and you don't get the same reward, you don't get a similar reward, then you will not uh, behave, you will not be able to continue or to do it again. 
Like for example, this is actually a really good, good example about my TikTok live. Because uh, the first time I did, I started doing these reading, these live reading uh, sessions was like two weeks ago. And what was the reward? The reward was the amount of response that I got from people. There were so many people that showed up on my live. And this gave me the reason it satisfied my desire. I was like, wow, this is amazing. So many, so many people joined and also uh, so much positive feedback. Everyone was enjoying it. So this gave me the reason to do it again. And now it's almost becoming a habit. I do it uh, one or two times a week. And I'm also very, very thankful to God that I have the time for it. So, um, so this is really, really interesting. So uh, your habit will never start. It's almost becoming a routine. But if, it, if, I, if I stop getting the response and people don't join, enough people don't join, I'm not going to just speak uh, to a screen. I am just going to do it for myself. I'm just going to enjoy reading. But thank you guys for joining. This has been amazing. And, uh, but that's something that you must know about habits. Anything you want to build. And since my... My page is about learning English. Every day for taking action about learning English, you need four things to build that daily habit to practice English. The first one is cue. You must have a cue, like something reminds you maybe on your phone or maybe you have your notebook or something on your desk to remind you. And you must get the craving, like the strong desire and feeling that you want to practice English, um, how, how this will make you feel whenever you learn like new words or say a couple more sentences. And what's the response? You pick up your phone, you pick up your headphone and you start listening or you start reading and practicing English. And what's the reward? The strong, good feeling that you get after you practice your English. So everything and without habits, you will never be able to learn English to the level that you desire. So don't forget, cue, craving, response and reward. All right, where are we? So the habit loop. Again, this is the habit loop. The best way to learn advanced English is this. Let's see. Atomic Habits. Yes, Lisha, thank you. That's the name of the book, Atomic Habits by uh, James Clear. Yeah, James Clear, Atomic Habits. So, what is, what is the habit loop? Loop means circle, like something that goes around and round and round. What is the habit loop? Cue, craving, re response, reward. So every habit that you have in your life, it's all like this. Good habits, bad habits, doesn't matter. In summary, the cue triggers a craving, forces a craving, pushes a craving which motivates a response, motivates a reaction, which provides a reward, which satisfies the craving, and finally becomes associated with the cue. Together, these four steps form a neurological feedback loop. So it goes all the way to your brain. It's not something uh, psychological, it's not something, uh, what is it? Uh, I'm not trying to, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it is something that goes, oh, it's, it's biology. So it goes all the way to your brain. It's not just something psychological. Cue, craving, response, reward. Cue, craving, response, reward. All right. Again, cue, craving, response, reward. 
that ultimately allows you to create automatic habits, automatic habits, automatic habits. This cycle is known as the habit loop, the habit loop. All right. So the four step process is not something that happens occasionally, but rather it's an endless feedback loop that is running and active during every moment you are alive. Even right now, the brain is continuously. Do you guys see well? Can you guys see it well? Oh, someone else is reading. I am on four chapter. Nice. Chapter four. I am on chapter four. Nice. The, the four step process is not something that happens occasionally, but rather it's an endless loop. It's an endless, endless loop. And it's running active during every moment you are alive, even right now. The brain is continuously, the brain is continuously scanning the environment, predicting what will happen next, trying out different responses, learning from the results. The entire process is completed in a split second. And we use it again and again without realizing everything that's been packed into the previous moment. We can split these four steps into two phases, the problem phase and the solution phase. The problem phase includes the cue and the craving. It is when you realize that something needs to change. The solution phase includes the response and the reward, and it's when you take action, achieve the change you desire. Problem phase, what is the problem phase? Q, craving. Solution phase, response, reward. Response, reward. All behavior, all behavior, every single behavior in your life is driven, is driven by the desire to solve a problem. Sometimes the problem is that you notice something good and you want to obtain it. Sometimes the problem is that you are experiencing pain and you want to relieve it. Either way, the purpose of every habit is to solve the problems you face. I will tell you guys a good example on, on like a personal story. Uh, what do you guys do when you get a headache? When you have a headache, what do you do? Can you guys comment what you do? What's your habit when you get a headache? Because that's the problem phase, right? You get a headache and then take a pill, take a pill, take pills, sleep. There you go. Try to sleep. Very nice. I take a walk. I will tell you this. I do not have any pain medicine in my house except one like for emergency or something. But for headache, uh, like pills for headache, never. Do not take a painkiller. And a lot, a lot of time, I'm not a doctor or anything. If you have migraine, migraine, like really bad headache, that is different. But whenever I have a headache, I immediately go for what? Water. That's my... That's my solution mechanism. And if you are patient, actually, your uh, the water will, uh, what will it do? It will, a lot of times headaches are because of dehydration, because you don't have enough water. So uh, a lot of times your, your headaches are, um, are because you have, um, you need to drink water. So I never take a pill. Don't take a pill. Just drink water. A lot of times, whenever you have a headache, like you wake up in the morning and you have a headache, 
that's because you didn't drink enough water the day before. So anyway, problem, solution. All behavior is, is driven by the desire to solve a problem. Sometimes the problem that you notice uh, is that you notice something good and you want to obtain it. Sometimes the, the problem is you are experiencing pain and you want to relieve it. Either way, the purpose of every habit is to solve problems you face. In the table on the following page, you can see a few examples of what this looks like in real life. Imagine walking into a dark room and flipping on the light switch. You have performed this simple habit so many times that it occurs without thinking. You proceed through all four stages in the fraction of a second. The urge to act strikes you without thinking. So you just go and turn on the light. By the time you become adults, sorry, we, by the time we become adults, we rarely notice the habits that are, that are what? That are running our lives. So we become like robots, guys. You know, like you think, oh, some people like, you know, make thousands of dollars or they are millionaires and this and that. And you, you think like your life is, you're just not lucky or something. It is literally everything is about our habits. Our habits run our lives. Our habits control our lives. You have better habits, you will have a better future. You will have bad habits. Uh you will probably not go end up somewhere good. So show the other page, show the other page. I will come back here, but first let me finish this. Most of us never give a second thought to the fact that we tie the same shoes each morning, right? Or unplug the toaster after each use and always change into comfortable clothes after getting home from work. After decades of mental programming, we, we automatically slip into these patterns of thinking and acting. So if you hang out with someone for two days, if you spend time for, with someone for two days, you can learn so much about their life just by noticing their behavior. By noticing their behavior, um, you will realize the kind of person they are. And also, it says breaking news. Famous TV host Oprah Winfrey passed away. That is so sad. That is so, so, so sad. Wow. But we shall continue reading. Uh, so problem phase, solution phase. And this is something else, by the way, guys. Do not react to news so fast. Like... Uh, it's very, very sad, actually. That's really, really sad. Someone said Oprah Winfrey just died. Um, but it's, it's just someone died. So we, we will go to that when we will check later. But our lives are the same. Anyway, problem phase, solution phase. That is the name of the book, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Your phone. Uh, this is like a really, really good life example of uh, a really good life example of our life, like examples of our daily lives of how these uh, the habit loop works. Q, the thing that triggers you, craving, the strong desire to take action, the, your action, your response to the action or to the craving, and then the reward. Your phone buzzes with a text message. Your phone buzzes with a text message, right? Maybe on like WhatsApp or you get a text from someone. What's the craving? What is the craving? You want to learn the contents of the message. Oh, who texted me? I want to see, right? And then what do you do? What's the action? What is the reaction that you, you take? You grab your phone and read the text, right? 
You satisfy your craving to read the message grabbing your phone becomes associated with your phone buzzing. Okay, it was fake. All right, that's fine. Oh my God, it's fake, guys. That was fake news. Okay, we're all good. Even if it was fake news, we still not react. Don't react to the news, guys. Don't react to the news. Don't react to fake news. Everything is fake. Yeah, okay. Thank you for confirming. But still, I don't care. Um, I never watch the news, by the way. That's another thing. A, a really bad habit is watching the news. Uh, it doesn't... Like, focusing more on your life, your own personal world, is more important than knowing what's happening on the other side of the world. You cannot worry so much about something you cannot control. Do not worry about something you cannot control. I repeat, do not worry about something you cannot control and it's not directly related to your own life. This does not make you a selfish person. You are not selfish. It's just you cannot control it. Why should I worry about something I why should I worry about something that I cannot control? Last time I checked the news was probably four years ago. I don't waste my time checking the news. I am aware. I know what's happening in the world, but I don't check the news. There's a lot more good stuff happening um, than bad. And there's no positivity in watching the news. Um, it's all creating reaction. There is... No, there is no new knowledge in the news. Every year is the same. So anyway, back to our reading. Instead of watching the news, read books, listen to podcasts, and try to improve your life. Okay. Next one, the Q. You are answering emails. What's the craving? You begin to feel stressed and overwhelmed by work. You want to feel in control, Right? You become stressed because you are answering emails. What's the response on the reaction? You bite your nails. You bite your nails. You satisfy your craving to reduce stress. Biting your nail becomes associated with answering emails. Next, another habit. You wake up. What's the craving? You want to feel alert. Right? You want, to, you want to feel awake. You drink a cup of coffee. Ooh, you're up. You satisfy your craving to feel alert, to feel awake. Drinking coffee becomes associated with waking up. That's me. That is exactly me. Because whenever I wake up in the morning, first thing I do, drinking coffee. So, uh, I don't feel bad about being a coffee addict. If they if if I if somebody calls me you are addicted to coffee, I'll be like I'll take it. We are good. This needs to be recorded. Is this being recorded? This needs to be recorded. I think it it records it in my app. I might post it on my YouTube. So, you smell a donut, a donut shop as you walk down the street near your office, or. You're walking down the street and there's a McDonald's and you feel, you smell the burger. Or you're driving down the street and you smell the kebab or the shawarma or, I don't know, taco. What happens? <laughs> what, what happens? You begin to crave a donut. You begin to crave a donut. You buy donut and eat it. What is the reward? You satisfy your craving to eat a donut. Buying a donut becomes associated with walking down the street near your office. So each time you walk down the street uh, near your office, you want to get a donut. That's why probably if you work in a place and there's a restaurant near, near your office or the place you work, you always eat in that place because it becomes a habit. 
I don't have smell for food. That's good. You are lucky, but... Or I don't get triggered with food smell. Oh, I do. I definitely do. <laughs> uh, okay, next one. You hit a stumbling block on a project at work. You feel stuck and want to relieve your frustration. You pull out your phone and check social media. So this is very, very true. Maybe you hit... Like you are working on, on a, if you're a student, you're working on some homework assignment or something, or you're working on a project, and then you feel stuck, and you want to feel relaxed. You pull out your phone and check social media, or maybe you're stressed and you check social media. You satisfy your craving to feel relieved. Checking social media becomes associated with feeling satisfied, feeling stressed stalled or feeling stuck at work so each time you feel stuck on a project you pull out your phone it becomes a habit you walk into a dark room you want to be able to see this is the craving what's the response you flip the light switch so you satisfy your craving to see turning on the light switch becomes associated with being in a dark room so anytime you are in a dark room what do you do you want to turn on the light switch. And thank you guys for joining. Thank you for sharing my live. Uh, not thank you so much for that fake news, but it's all good. <laughs> what a book. What book is this? It is called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. That's the name of the book. It is a really, really one of my favorite books about habit. I've read a few books about habit. This one is my favorite. Uh, and thank you for sharing my live. I appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you guys are enjoying this book. I love it. And I hope you are benefiting from this book. This is just the beginning. It's, it's, it's not even, we haven't even gotten to the most important part of the book. We have not gotten to the most important part of the book. Okay. So there are four laws of behavior change. Four laws, four, four very important laws of habit change. Um, and this is the part, this is everything that the book talks about. It talks about uh, the four laws. There are four important laws to build a habit or break a habit or change your behavior. How about Power of Habit? I love Power of Habit. Actually, this book is very similar to Power of Habit. Uh, it talks a lot about Power of Habit uh, because it came after the Power of Habit and it added more information to the Power of Habit. So, Seisha, thank you for sending a rose. What is the name of this book? Atomic Habits, Atomic Habits by James Clear, this book. So in the following chapters, we will see time and time and again how the four stages of cue, craving, response, reward, influence nearly everything we do each day. But before we do that, we need to transform these four steps into a practical framework that we can use to design good habits and eliminate bad ones, remove bad ones, remove bad habits. I refer to this framework as the four laws of behavior change, and it provides a simple set of rules for creating good habits and breaking bad ones, breaking bad habits. So, I love this, this. This is like the key to make any habit work or break any habit. You can think of each law as a lever that influences human behavior. When the levers are in the right position, creating good habits is effortless. It's very easy. Very easy. When they are in the wrong positions, it's nearly impossible. Okay. So this is the... This is everything you need to know about how to build a good habit. How to build a good habit. What is the first law? The first law is cue, the thing that triggers you. 
the thing that triggers you, the thing that triggers you to, do, to take action. What is that? What is the cue? Make it obvious. Make it obvious. So um, in order for a habit, for, for, in order for you to create a habit, you need the first law, the first rule. The first rule of the game is to make it obvious. And we will talk into details. Whenever we start uh, in the next page, we're going to start reading the first chapter, make it obvious. The first law is what? Make it obvious. Make it clear. Thank you, see it, Sarir. Make it, um, make the habit clear. Make the cue clear. And I will give you a very simple example. I'll give you a simple example. Again, this is my water, right? What is making it obvious? It's right there in front of me, right? So if you want to drink water, but you don't have cups, chances are you will not drink water. So make it obvious. This is the first law, which is the cue. The second law is craving. So craving, uh, you have a craving, right? A strong desire. Make it attractive. Make it beautiful. Make it attractive. Simple, 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 simple example is, again, my water bottle. If my water bottle or my tumbler, this is in English, this is called tumbler. If my tumbler is good looking, like it's cute or it's nice and it has a nice shape, then it makes me feel like I want to drink water out of it because it's attractive. It attracts me. If it's an ugly cup, maybe no. The third law, responds, 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 your reaction, your action, right? Make it easy, make it easy. So make it easy for yourself to drink water, right? If I don't have this with me, then it's not easy. I have to go all the way to the kitchen to grab it, right? But if, if I make it easy for me, if this is always with me, then it will be uh, yes, if your bottle is near you, you can drink it. Very easy. So the same thing. And the fourth law is make it satisfying. Make it satisfying. Make it feel like it makes you feel good. Right? Ah, uh, I am. I'm not thirsty anymore. To and this is this is on the like the other side of the coin. If you have a bad habit, how to break a bad habit? How to break a bad habit? The inversion of the first law, the cue. Let's say you want to smoke cigarette. Instead of making it obvious, make it invisible. Like hide your cigarette somewhere or don't take it with you, right? Inversion of the second law, the craving, the, the feeling, the strong feeling, make it unattractive, right? Make it unattractive, make it look ugly. The third law, reaction, the response, make it difficult. Like I said, don't take it with you. And if you take your cigarette with you, if you have a cigarette, don't take the lighter. So you want to smoke, but ah, I don't have a lighter. Ah, forget it. I'm not going to smoke. Inversion of the fourth law, make it unsatisfying. After you smoke, think about the terrible feeling, like bad smell and all of that. Make it unsatisfying. So this is the next part. How can I make it obvious? How can I make it attractive? How can I make it easy? And how can I make it satisfying? Let's go to the next part. If you have ever wondered, why don't I do what I say I'm going to do? Why don't I lose the weight or stop smoking? or save for retirement or start that side business? Why do I say something is important but never seem to make time for it? Who in the life has promised so many times that they want to work out, they want to go to the gym, they want to lose weight, or they want to cook healthy food, but they 
and they just can't seem to do it. Every day you're like, oh, I want to practice more or I want to do this, but you never seem to start. Do we have anyone? Raise your hand. <laughs> Why do I say something is important but never seem to make time for it? Well, the answers to those questions can be found somewhere in these four laws, these four rules that we just talked about. Okay, we have some people, right? We have some people that feel related, relatable or that relate because I can say the same thing. Me, 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 me. Yeah, we have a lot of people. Well, this is why. The answer is this. This, uh, the, the, the answers to those questions can be found somewhere in these four laws. The key to creating, the most important thing to creating good habits and breaking bad ones is to understand these important laws and how to change them to your specifications. Every goal is doomed to fail. Every goal can fail if it goes against the grain of human nature. Your habits, your habits are shaped by the systems in your life. In the chapters that follow, we will discuss these laws one by one and show how you can use them to create a system in which good habits appear, good habits emerge naturally, and bad habits wither away, bad habits disappear, bad habits disappear. So, again, think about it. Your habits are shaped by the systems in your life. This is very important. And so we're going to go and start reading the first, uh, we're going to start reading the first chapter or the first law. It's a very interesting book. Yeah, thank you very much. I know, I love this book. I wish I wrote it because they just sold 10 million copies. A habit is a behavior that's been repeated enough times to be to become automatic. The ultimate purpose of habit is to solve problems of life with as little energy and effort as possible. Any habit can be broken down into a feedback loop that involves four steps. Cue, craving, response, and reward. The four laws of behavior change are a simple set of rules we can use to build better habits. They are make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. Where can I buy this book? Show me the book. Uh, you, can, you can buy it on Amazon, on eBay, anywhere, or even the local bookstore. It's called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits by James Clear. And by the way, thank you for your likes and following me for uh, for sharing my live. Keep hitting that like. I don't even know what that does to me, but uh, I think it does something. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, so we are done with this chapter, guys. Hi from Russia. Where are you from? Wow. One, two, three, four, five, Muse. I love your live. Thank you very much. To make it visible on others, F, others, FYP. Oh, okay. Well, then hit that like. Hit that like. Again, I'm not the kind of person, really, I always say, if you don't find benefit from my page, get out of there. Do not follow pages that don't bring... Uh, I'm Arabic native speaker. I always have problems with our pronunciation at the end of words. Follow my pay, for, follow and subscribe to my podcast. I have a lot of uh, good lessons to help you improve your English the easy way. All right. Finland. Wow. How long is this book? It's a long book. It's, you see, 
So, guys, we are in the first law. The first law. Safa Shokri, I like your explanation. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you for sending those roses and stuff. Hello from Kenya, South Africa. All my links are in my... I have a YouTube channel. I don't post a lot of videos, but I might start posting more and more as time allows. Um, I have Instagram. I have a podcast for learning English. So um, all the links are in my profile. The links are in my profile. So go subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want. Um, subscribe to my podcast. I have like 80 lessons and I will be making more and more and more. Um, and they're all free. It's all free. Okay, I will, I will do that. Hi from Ukraine. Thank you. Wow, from, yeah, from Chicago. I think I recognize you. So, guys, the first law. Make it obvious. Make it obvious. So, I will do 30 minutes of reading and then I shall leave. 30 more minutes. Your podcast is on Spotify. Yes, my podcast is on Spotify. I will type my podcast name. Podcast. The English Zone. Guys, we will start reading. Pin this comment. Okay. Podcast. All right, let's continue reading. The man who didn't look right. The psychologist Gary Klein once told me a story about a woman who attended a family gathering. She had spent years working as a paramedic and upon arriving at the event, took one look at her father-in-law and got very concerned. I don't like the way you look, she said. Her father-in-law, who was feeling perfectly fine, jokingly replied, Well, I don't like your looks either. No, she insisted. You need to go to the hospital now. A few hours later, the man was undergoing life-saving surgery after an, an examination had revealed that he had a blockage to a major artery and was at immediate risk of a heart attack. Without his daughter-in-law's intuition, he could have died. What did the paramedic see? How did she predict his impending heart attack? When, uh, when major arteries are obstructed, the body focuses on sending blood, uh, sending blood to critical organs and away from peripheral locations near the surface of the skin. The result is a change in the pattern of distribution of blood in the face. After many years of working with people, after many years of working with people with heart failure, the woman had knowing, unknowingly developed the ability to recognize this pattern on sight. She couldn't explain what it was and she noticed she couldn't explain what it was that she noticed in her father-in-law's face but she knew something was wrong. Similar stories exist in other fields. For example, military analysts can identify which blip on a radar screen is an enemy missile and which one is a plane from their own fleet even though they are traveling at the same speed. Flying at the same altitude and look identical on radar in nearly every aspect. During the Gulf War, Lieutenant Commander Michael Riley saved an entirely battleship when he ordered a missile shot down, despite the fact that it looked exactly like a battleship, battleship's own planes on radar. He made the right, the right call, 
but even even his superior officers couldn't explain how he did it. Muse museum curators have been known to discern the difference between an authentic piece of art and an expertly produced counterfeit. Counterfeit means fake. Even though they can't tell you precisely which details tip them off. Experienced radiologists can look at a brain scan and predict the area where a stroke will develop before any obvious signs are visible to the untrained eye. I've even heard hairdressers noticing whether a client is pregnant based only on the feel of her hair. Wow, that's crazy. The human brain is a prediction machine. It, con it is continuously taking in your surrounding and analyzing the information it, cams it comes across. Whenever you experience something repeatedly, like a paramedic seeing the face of a heart attack patient, or a military analyst seeing a missile on a radar screen, your brain begins noticing what's important. Sorting through the details and highlighting relevant cues. Cataloging that information, cat cataloging that information for future use. With enough practice, you can pick up the ones on the cue that predict certain outcomes without consciously thinking about it. Automatically, Your brain encodes or reads the lessons learned through experience. We can't explain always. We can't always explain what it is we're learning. But learning is happening all, all along the way. And your ability to notice the relevant cues in a given situation is the foundation of every habit you have. We underestimate how much our brain and, and bodies can do without thinking. You do not tell your, brain, your hair to grow, your heart to pump, your lungs to breathe, or your stomach to digest. And yet your body handles all of this and more on autopilot, like a robot. You are much more than your conscious self. Consider hunger. Think about hunger. How do you know when you're hungry? You don't necessarily have to see a cookie on the counter to realize that it's, it's time to eat. Appetite and hunger are governed non-consciously. Your body has a variety of feedback loops that gradually alert you when it's time to eat again. And that track what is going and that track what's going on around you within you and within you and inside you. Cravings can arise thanks to hormones and chemicals circulating through your body. Suddenly, you're hungry, even though you're not quite sure what tipped you off. This is one of the most surprising insights about our habits. You don't need to be aware of the cue for a habit to begin. You can notice an opportunity and take action without dedicating conscious attention to it. This is what makes habits useful. It's what makes them dangerous. It's also what makes them dangerous. As habits form, your actions come under the direction of your automatic and non-conscious mind. You fall into old patterns before you realize what's happening. Unless someone points it out, you may not notice that you cover your mouth without with your hand whenever you laugh. That you apologize before asking a question. Or that you have a habit of finishing other people's sentences. And the more you repeat these patterns, the less likely you... Uh, The more you repeat these patterns, the less likely the less likely you become to question what you're doing and why you're doing it. So habits are very important in life basically in any in business, in relationship, in marriage, um uh, like 
it relates to everything in your life. And when you are not aware of your habits, sometimes you, you think you are listening to someone, but you're actually not listening to someone. You're just listening, but you're waiting to respond. So uh, that's because of your habits. Your habit is always uh, what? To respond, not to listen. But once you become more aware of these habits, you are what? You are going to become aware and you're going to change the habits you don't like. I once heard, please tell me you are Dr. Willie Call it. No, I'm not. If you're asking me. I once heard of a of a retail clerk who was instructed to cut up empty gift cards after customers had used up the balance on the card. So empty gift cards. Uh, so the clerk at the at the rest at the at the store, um, they told they told her to cut up empty gift cards after every customer had used them. Uh, like if you used all the balance on the gift card, the the clerk, the person working there would cut up the card. One day, one day, uh, the clerk cashed out a few customers in a row, one by one, who purchased with gift cards. When the next person walked up, the clerk swiped the customer card, the customer's actual credit card, picked up the scissors, and then cut it in half, entirely on autopilot, like a robot. Entirely like a robot, before looking up at the stunned customers and realizing what had just happened. Another woman I came across to research in my research was a former preschool teacher who had switched to a corporate job. Even though she was now working with adults, her old habits would kick in and she kept asking coworkers if they had if they had washed their hands after going to the bathroom. I also found the story of a man who had spent years working as a lifeguard would occasionally yell walk whenever he saw a child running. So basically we are creatures of habits. Crazy, right? What is one thing that you guys have done? And thank you guys for sharing my life. Are you enjoying this book? Let me know in Z comments. Oh, you always eat fast, though not on short break anymore. Oh, so <laughs> you used to be on short breaks, and so you used to always eat fast. And now, even though you're not on, um, like, on short breaks anymore, you still eat fast. I like the way you read it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm trying to think of something, but I can't. Uh, anyway, over time, we will continue reading for another 20 minutes. You have a very pleasant voice. Thank you very much. Always forgiving someone who has anger issues, even though I know he will repeat it. Yeah. Exactly. So habits is not just in, uh, it's not just in like action. It's also in talking. It's also in thinking, like thinking habits, feeling habits, all of those. It's a part of habit. So yeah, it totally makes sense. But this is the most interesting part about all of those. Now you are aware of it, right? Over time, the cues that spark our habits become so common that they are essentially invisible. You don't even notice it when that happens, right? 
you don't even notice that happens. The treats on the kitchen counter, the remote control next to the couch, the phone in our pockets, our responses to these cues are so deeply encoded, ingrained in our brain, that it may feel like the urge to act comes from nowhere. It just comes like, uh, right? It just comes so naturally we're like robots. Why is this so important? For this reason, we must begin the process of behavior change with awareness. Awareness. This is the most important part about anything in your life. If you do not have awareness, you cannot accomplish anything in your life and you will not be able to be aware of your actions, the way you talk, the way you think, and you will do um, crazy things. So awareness, it's like an urge, it's become a habit. Whenever we argue, there's an urge with me to go to him. Yeah, 100%, I 100% agree. So we have to change Atomic Habits. That's the name of the book, Atomic Habits. The name of the book, again, like I said, the name of the book is Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits is the name of the book. All right. So, awareness is the most important part of human behavior. And what's awareness? Awareness means knowing what you're doing, being aware, realizing your action. Before we can effectively build new habits, we need to get a handle on our current ones. So before you try to change some habit, you you, under, you need to understand why you want to cha change your habit. What habits do you already have that you, you want to change, right? This can become more challenging than it sounds. It's more difficult than you think. It's more difficult than you think because once a habit is firmly rooted in your life, it is mostly non-conscious and automatic. You're not even aware of it. If a habit remains mindless, you can't expect to improve it. As the psychologist Carl Jung said, until you make the conscious, the unconscious conscious, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. This is powerful, guys. This is very, very powerful. If you don't sit down, if you don't sit down on your couch or somewhere and just think, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? If you don't sit down and try to see what is it you are doing and you make that conscious, you make that more clear and you become more aware of it, it will direct your life and you will call it, call it fate, right? So we have to become aware of our habits. That's the first step for habit change. This, the habits scoreboard, the habits scoreboard. The Japanese railway system is regarded as one of the best in the world. If you ever find yourself riding a train in Tokyo, you will notice that the conductors have a peculiar, sorry, not peculiar, peculiar, peculiar habit, strange habit, interesting habit. What is their habit? Has that, do we have anyone from Japan or has anyone been to Tokyo? What is the habit? Each operator runs the train. As each operator runs the train, they proceed through a ritual of pointing at different objects and calling out commands. When the train approaches a signal, the operator points at it and say, signal is green. As the 
As the train pulls in into and out of each station, the operator will point at the speedometer and call out the exact speed. When it is time to leave, the operator will point at the timetable and state the time. Out of the platform, other employees are performing similar actions. Before each train departs, the staff members will point along the edge of the platform, declare all clear. Every detail is identified pointed at and named aloud. All clear. Every detail is identified, pointed at, and named aloud. This process, known as pointing and calling, is, to sa safe, is, is a safety system designed to reduce mistakes. It seems silly, but it works incredibly well. Pointing and calling reduces errors by up to 85% and cuts accidents by 30%. The MTA subway in New York City adopted a modified version of it, uh, point only, and with two years of implementation, incidents of incorrectly uh, perth subways fell 57%. Pointing and calling is so effective because it raises the level of awareness. You see, guys, back to awareness. Awareness. From a non-conscious habit to a more conscious level because they are more likely to notice problems before something goes wrong. My wife does something similar. Whenever we are preparing to walk out the door for a trip, she verbally calls out the most essential, the most essential what? Items in her packing list. I've got my keys. I've got my wallet. I've got my glasses. I've got my husband. I love this part. The more automatic a behavior becomes, the less likely we are, we are to consciously think about it. So whenever you leave your house, you say, I skip one line, really? I don't know. I don't know what line I skipped. But the more automatic a behavior becomes, the less likely we are to consciously think about it. And then, and when we, we've done something a thousand times before, we begin to overlook things, to look at things. We assume, we think, assume means think or guess. We assume that, uh, we assume that the next time will be just like the last. We're so used to doing we're so used to doing what we've always done that we don't stop to question whether it's the right thing to do it at all. Many of our failures in performance are largely related or attributed, attributable to a lack of self-awareness. So guys, self-awareness. Self-awareness is the, the ultimate way to success or anything you want to. Like a lot of times, if you're in a relationship or something, you're married, you think everything is your partner's fault. And then you start thinking and you have more awareness. You're like, oh, hmm, I might be toxic too. Or how, like even friendship and family, even with family. So self-awareness will help you um, put your ego aside and try to take action into something good. This is the name of the book, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. So, one of the greatest challenges in changing habits is maintaining awareness of what we're actually doing. This helps explain why the con consequences of habits can sneak up on us. 
We need a point and call system for our personal lives. For our personal lives, that's the origin of the habit scoreboard, which is a simple exercise you can use to become more aware of your behavior. To create your own, make a list of your daily habits. Here's a simple. Here's a sample of where your habit list、uh, might start. Wake up, turn off the alarm, check my phone, go to the bathroom, weigh myself. Take a shower, brush my teeth, floss my teeth, put on deodorant, hang up the towel to dry, get dressed, make a cup of tea, and so on. All right. Once you have a full list, look at each behavior, and ask yourself: Is this a good habit, a bad habit? Or a neutral habit. Neutral means it's not good, it's not bad. It's just something you have to do. If it's a good habit, write plus next to it. If it's a bad habit, write minus next to it. If it's a if it's a neutral habit, just write equal. For example, the list above might look like this. This is the exact page I read last night. Wow. <laughs> That's good to know. Other people are also reading my book. It's not my book, but it's a, a book that I am currently reading. So, if if the habit is positive, you do it like this. You can even do do this in your phone, guys. You can write all of your morning habits on your phone. Actually, I am going to start it myself because I、uh, I'm going to put this on my phone. Lagos Igbo Girl. This is the name of the book. Atomic habits. What time do you start your life? One.、Uh, I put the event on my.、Uh, I put the event on my phone. So sorry on my.、Uh, on my profile, so you can see the event for the next live. But it's going to be Monday and Tuesday. But I might do another one on Friday. So we will see. And I will start where I stop on this life. So anyway, you can even do this on your phone. You can type all of the、um, self-help books.、Uh, see, I don't consider this more like self-help book, but it is self-help book. But it's more like helping you understand yourself. I don't like self-help books anymore because it's all like. I don't like those books that says do this, do that, do this, do that. But if it's related to human behavior, if it's related to research, science, and all of that, I am down for it because you can learn. Yeah. So,、um, I don't consider it self help. It's it's like helping you, anyways. So you put this on your your phone. If it's a neutral habit, you just put equal. If it's a、uh, if it's negative, check my phone. That's negative, right? Go to the bathroom equal. Weigh myself. That's positive. Take a shower. That's good. Brush my teeth. Floss my teeth. Put on deodorant, and then make a cup of tea. That's also not too bad. But anyway, so. Pointing and calling, right? This marks、uh, the marks you give to a particular habit will depend on your situation and your goals. For someone who's trying to lose weight, eating a bagel with peanut butter every morning might be a bad habit. For someone who's trying to bulk up and add muscle, the same behavior might be a good habit. It all depends on what you're working toward. Scoring your habits can be a bit more complex. For another reason as well, the labels "good habit" and "bad habit" are slightly inaccurate. There are no good or bad habits. There are only effective habits. Guys, I love this. There are no good or bad habits. So don't feel so bad about your your life. You think like you have bad habits. There are no good or bad habits. There are only effective habits. That is effective at solving problems, because your entire life is about solving problems. Problems are good, 
but only good problems are good, like solving good problems. All habits serve you in some way, even the bad ones, which is why you repeat them. For this exercise, categorize your habits by how they will benefit you in the long run. Generally speaking, good habits will have net positive outcomes. That means good results. Bad habits have bad results. Smoking a cigarette may reduce stress right now. That's how it's serving you, but it's not a healthy long-term behavior. If you're still having trouble determining how to rate a particular habit, here's the question I like to use. Does this behavior help me become the type of person I wish to be? Does this habit cast a vote for or against my desired identity? Habits that reduce your desired identity are usually good. Um, habits that reinforce your desire, that encourages your desired identity, are usually good. Habits that conflict with your desired identity are usually bad. So habits that are conflict with desired identity that are against your desired identity are actually bad for you. As you create your habit scoreboard, scorecard, there is no need to change anything at first. The goal is to simply notice what's going on. So don't judge yourself. Don't be mean or try to judge yourself and say, oh my God, this is bad. The goal is to simply notice, observe, having self-awareness, right? Um, the goal is to simply notice what is actually going on. Observe your thoughts and actions without judgment or internal or uh, internal internal what? Internal criticism. Don't blame yourself for your faults. Don't praise yourself for your success. If you eat a chocolate bar every morning, I love this part, guys. Uh, this reminds me of another book that I have read. It's called The Power of Now. It's about like being present and living in the present moment. Um, that one of the best ways to improve your life is to not judge yourself. Do not blame yourself. Do not praise yourself for your successes. If you eat a chocolate bar every morning, acknowledge it almost as if you were watching someone else. I love this. So if you have a bad, bad habit, acknowledge it almost as if you were watching someone else. Oh, how interesting that they would do such a thing. If you binge eat, if you eat a lot, simply notice that you are eating more calories than you should. If you waste time online, like on the phone, on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, notice that you are spending your life away in a way that you do not want to. You are wasting your life. The first step to changing bad habits is to be on the lookout for them. If you feel like you need extra help, then you can try pointing and calling in your own life. Say out loud the action that you are thinking of taking, what the outcome will be if you want to cut back on your junk food habit, but notice yourself. Wait, did I miss something? Say out loud the action that you are thinking of taking and what the outcome will be. If you want to cut back on junk food, uh, on your junk food habit, but notice yourself grabbing another cookie, say out loud, I am about to eat this cookie, but I don't need it. Eating it will cause me to gain weight and hurt my health. Hearing your bad habits spoken aloud makes the consequences seem more real. It adds weight to the action rather than letting yourself Miss, uh, mindlessly slip into an old routine. This approach is useful even if you're simply trying to remember a task on your to-do list. 
Just saying out loud, tomorrow I need to go to the post office after lunch, increases the odds that you'll actually do it. You're getting yourself to acknowledge the need for action. And that can make all the difference. The process of behavior change always starts with awareness. Again, I must. Guys, everything is about awareness. And does everybody know the meaning of awareness? Awareness. Strategies. Strategies like pointing and calling. Strategies like pointing and calling. What is it? On the habit scoreboard. Uh, pointing and calling and the habit scoreboard, scoreboard are focused on getting you to recognize that your habits and acknowledge the cues that trigger them, which makes it possible to respond in a way that benefits you. So, wow, guys, we read one chapter. We will read... Uh, the beginning of this new chapter, and then we will stop because I, I love this next one. But this is a chapter summary for those who are just joining or for those who are not here. Being conscious. Yes, awareness is being conscious. Uh, being conscious of your actions. I mean, anger, I need management classes. Uh, one of the best books I read in 2022. Yeah, right? I love this book. Um, reading is the best thing that you can do for, your, for yourself. For those who say like this book or books are stupid, think about it. This somebody spent years and years and years um, writing this book, doing research and spending all that time and energy and motivation to write a book that they thought they needed in their own life, right? Uh, and you buy it for $20, for $30. You are a journey. You're, you're taking a journey into someone else's life. And you're, you're reading all of that research and learning all that knowledge without going out yourself and doing the research, Right? You don't have to believe everything you read. This is something very important. Don't believe everything you read. But if you learn from it, it increases your knowledge. Keep going. What do you guys think? Agree or disagree? You should read the Bible. You should read the Quran. The Quran, I will say that the best book in the entire, I could be wrong, but the best book in the entire world is the Quran. Because it's not re written by a human. So, the summary. And I love all the other religions too. But I'm Muslim, so... Um, I look at the Quran not just because I'm Muslim, but all that knowledge... All the, all the miracles that are in the Quran. It's crazy. With enough practice, your brain will pick up on the cues that predict certain outcomes without consciously thinking about it. With enough practice, your brain will pick up on the cues that predict certain outcomes without consciously thinking about it. So... If you practice more and more and more, your brain will pick up the cues that predict certain outcomes without thinking about it. You don't need to think about it, right? Once our habits become automatic, we stop paying attention to what we're doing. The process of behavior change is always um, always starts with awareness. Guys, this awareness thing is my favorite. This is something I have started doing, paying it, like being aware of my own actions uh, in the past two years, and it has changed my life. 
You need to be aware of your habits before you can change them. Pointing and calling raises your level of awareness from non-conscious habit to a more conscious level by verbalizing your actions. The habit scoreboard is a simple exercise you can use to become more aware of your behavior. There you go. Next, the best way to start a new habit. Yeah, let's go. Thank you so much. Hi from Argentina. What is the name of this book? This book has no name. No, I'm joking. This book, this is the name of the book, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Somebody said, what is the Quran? The Quran is uh, just like the Bible, but for Muslims. Uh, you can Google it. But I love all the information on the, the things in the Bible too. I believe all religions come from the same God. So they all have the same message. Anyways. The best way to start a new habit. What is the best way? Yeah, you can find this book in Arabic. I'm pretty sure it is translated to Arabic. If you just look up Atomic Habits in Arabic, um, maybe you can find it. Uh, I will read for 20 more minutes, 20, 25 more minutes, and then we shall stop because I must go uh, do stuff. I don't know what time it is where you guys are, but it's uh, 3 p.m. where I live. Do you have a YouTube channel? Yes, find all my links. Find all my links on my profile. Uh, YouTube, I got a podcast. And I uh, I also have Instagram. If you have any questions, if you are looking for online courses for English, anything else, you can reach out uh, and uh, message me on Instagram. But yeah, I have a lot of free stuff. All my podcast is all free. The links are in my bio, the English Zone. You can find it on Spotify or Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts. So anyway, let's keep going. And by the way, at the end of the live, I will do about like a 10, 15 minute question answer. If you guys have any questions about the book or anything else regarding learning English or behavior or anything I know. I'm not an expert in anything. I just want you to know. I am just like you learning. So, but I'll be happy to discuss. The best way to start a new habit. In 2001, researchers in Great Britain began to working with 248 people to build better exercise habits. Over the course of two weeks, the subjects were divided into three groups. The first group was the control group. They were simply asked to, to track how often they exercised. The second group was the motivation group. They were asked not only to track their workouts, but also to, re, to read some material on the benefits of exercise. The researchers also explained to the groups how exercise could reduce the risk of coronary heart disease and improve heart health. Finally, there was the third group. These subjects received the same presentation as the second group, which ensured that they had equal levels of motivation. However, they were also asked to formulate a plan for when and where they would exercise over the following week. Specifically, each member of the third group completed the following sentence. I love this. Guys, this is one of my favorite parts of the book. During the next week, I will take part, I will participate, I will partake. I will take part in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise, strong exercise, on day time and place uh, this person says no reference if you go to the to the end of the book you will find all the reference and i don't i'm not sure you will uh, you 
I'm not sure if you really want to spend time on this. You don't want to spend time reading it. I'm not sure if you want to go and read any of these research that's been done. There's all the research in the reference page. You can find it. So, so yeah, if you want to find all the research, you can find all of the, all of the uh, research and the reference in the back. This is not a research paper. You can't find uh, something you need to understand about books. You can't find the reference in the page. It's all the way in the backs, in the back. Anyway, you're welcome. The next week, during the next week, I'll partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on the day, at the time, and the place. In the first and second groups, 30 35 to 38 percent, 35 to 38 percent of the people exercised uh, at least once per week. Interestingly, the motivational presentation given to the second group seemed to have no meaning, meaningful impact on behavior, but 91 percent of the third group exercised at least once per week, more than double the normal rate. The sentence they filled out is what researchers refer to as the implementation intention, like taking action, which is a plan you make beforehand about when and where to act. That is how you intend to implement a particular habit. The cue, the cues that can trigger a habit in a wide range of forms um, the feel of your phone buzzing in your pocket, the smell of chocolate chip cookies, the sound of ambulance sirens. But the two most common cues are time and location. Implementation intention leverage both of these cues. Broadly speaking, the format for creating an implementation intention is this. When a situation, when situation X happens or arises, I will per perform this response or I'll take this action. So this is a very, very powerful thing. So uh, you know how we will get to that part when you have to be clear with what you want to do on a daily on a daily basis. So being more clear of what you do will help you achieve that or take that action. Hundreds of studies have shown that implementation intentions are effective for sticking to our goals, whether it's writing down the exact weather, whether it's writing down the exact time and date of when you will get a flu shot or recording the time of your colonoscopy appointment. They increase the odds that people will stick with habits like recycling, studying, going to sleep early or stop and stopping smoking. Researchers have even found that voter turnout increases when people are forced to create implementation intentions by answering questions like, what route are you taking to the polling station? At what time? Uh, where is it? At what time are you planning to go? What bus will you, what bus will get you there? Other successful government programs uh, prompt citizens to make a clear plan to next taxes, to send taxes in, to send taxes in on time, and provide directions on when and where to pay late traffic bills. The punchline is clear: people who make a specific plan for when and where they will perform a new habit are more likely to follow through. Too many people try to change their habits without these specific details figured out. We tell ourselves, I am going to eat healthier or I am going to write more. But we never say when and where these habits are going to happen. So that's the most important part. That's the most important part of... Like, let's say... Today, you want to go to the gym or you want to exercise. You must make it clear when you are going and where you're going. These habits are going to happen. Um, 
We, we never say when and where these habits are going to happen. We leave it up to chance and hope that we will just remember to do it or feel motivated at the right time. An implementation intention sweeps away foggy notions, unclear intentions, or unclear ideas like I want to work out more, or I want to be more productive, or I should vote, mm -mm. and transform them into a concrete plan of action. Many people think that they lack motivation when they, what they really lack is clarity, being clear of, of what they want. Like he says, I want to lose weight, I want to drink more water, or I want to make more money, but that is not clear. It's not always obvious when and where to take action. Some people spend their entire lives waiting for, for the time to be right to make an improvement. Like you think one day everything is going to be right. You're like, when I graduate high school or when I graduate college, I will do this. I will do that. Or I will be more fit. I will do this. But you can't wait for the right moment because it will never come. Sometimes there are situations where maybe there is the right time for the right thing. But when it comes to habits and things like that, it's not always obvious when and where. Uh, like... You must be clear. So anyway, once an implementation intention has been set, you don't have to wait for inspiration to strike. Do I write a chapter today or not? Do I meditate this morning or at lunch? When the moment of action occurs, there is no need to make a decision. Simply follow your predetermined plan. Like today, I already I had made a plan to do a live at 1 p.m. And I had written it down. And I also had written it down where? At home. So I went and I did all the things I needed to do uh, outside. Um, run errands, get the stuff done. And then at 1 p.m., I came back and I started this live. Because I was clear about my daily goal. And I'm not saying that, by the way... So you think like I'm perfect. But if I had not made that reminder, I wouldn't, I would have forgotten or been busy. But I had it in the back of my mind and I had written it down that I will behavior at time in location. What do you guys think? Do you agree with this? And is anyone doing this? What is the name of this book? Garcia. It is called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. So this is, these are a bunch of examples for that. Yes, I do read other books too. Meditation. And by the way, we have 10 minutes before I end the live. Wow, I've been here for an hour and, an hour and 30 minutes. Meditation. I will meditate for one minute at 7 a.m. in my kitchen. Studying. I will study Spanish or English. I will study English in our case because my page is about teaching English, learning English and all of that. So I will study English for 20 minutes at 6 p.m. in my bedroom. I will study English for 30 minutes um, at 8 a.m. in my kitchen whatever. Exercise. I will exercise for one hour at 5 p.m. in my local gym. Marriage. I will make my partner a cup of tea at 8 a.m. in the kitchen. If you aren't sure when to start your habit, try the first day of the week, month, or year. People are more likely to take action. People are more likely to take action. Uh, at those times. That's why, you know, people believe in like New Year's resolutions and things that they want to do at the beginning of the year. It's because they think it works. Because hope is usually higher. We have higher hopes. We have hope. If we have hope, we have a reason to take action. A fresh start feels motivating, right? 
if you go to the gym now by the way like the night before i was at the gym and oh my god there were so many people at the gym because it's the beginning of the year and everyone's so motivated there's another benefit to implementation intention being specific about what you want and how you will achieve it helps you say no this is also another favorite part it will help you say no to things that derail progress that will stop progress distract your attention and pull you off course pull you off course remove you from your uh, your your path we often say yes to little requests because we are not clear enough about what we need to be doing instead when your dreams are vague not clear vague means non non clear non clear or not clear where your dreams are vague it's easy to rationalize little expectations all day long and never get around to the specific things you need to do to succeed give your habits a time and a space to live in the world the goal is to make the time and location so obvious that with enough repetition you get an urge to do the right thing at the right time even if you can't say why as the writer jason zwig whatever the last name is noted obviously you're never going to just work out without conscious thought but like a dog salivating at a bell maybe you start to get antsy around the time of day you normally work out there are many ways to use implementation intentions in your life and work my favorite approach is when i learned from stanford professor bj fox it's a strategy i refer to as habit stacking habit stacking this is the last part that i'm going to read guys and thanks everyone for joining and thank you for sharing my life thank you for sending your likes and i hope that you are benefiting from this book and i really hope that you will make a big change in your life um, by making better decisions in your life that will help you change your life i will be here this will be the last part that i will read and in the next live i will continue reading the same book so habit stacking the french prof prof uh, philosopher dennis uh D. De Rot, D. De Rot, whatever the last name is, lived nearly his entire life in poverty, but that all changed one day in 1765. Diderot's daughter was about to be married, and he could not afford to pay for the wedding. Despite his lack of wealth, Diderot was well known for his role as the co-founder and writer of England encyclopedia one of the most comprehensive encyclopedias of all time when catherine the great the empress of russia heard of Diderot's financial troubles her heart went out to him she was a book lover and greatly enjoyed his encyclopedia she offered to buy Diderot's personal library for for how much for 1000 euros more than 150000 today suddenly diderot had money to spare with his new wealth he not only paid for the wedding but also acquired a scarlet robe for himself diderot diderot's scarlet robe was beautiful so beautiful that in fact he immediately noticed how out of place it seemed when surrounded by his more common possessions he wrote that there was no more coordination, no more unity, no more beauty between his elegant robe and the rest of his stuff. Diderot soon felt the urge to upgrade his possessions. He replaced his rug with one more, one from Damascus. 
Damascus is in Syria, the capital of Syria. Anyone from Syria? He decorated his home with expensive sculptures. He bought a mirror to, to place above the mantle and a better kitchen table, a better kitchen table. He tossed aside his old straw, straw chair for a leather, uh, leather one. Like falling dom uh, dominoes, one purchase led to the next. Diderot's behavior is not uncommon. In fact, the tendency for one purchase to lead to another, another one has the same, has a name, the Diderot effect. Diderot effect. The Diderot effect states that obtaining a new possession often creates a spiral of consumption that leads to additional purchases. This is so true, guys. This is very true. You can spot this pattern everywhere. You buy a dress, this is for the girls, for the ladies. You buy a dress and have to get new shoes and earrings to match. You buy a couch and suddenly you question the layout of your entire living room. You buy a toy for your child and soon find yourself purchasing all of the accessories that go with it. It's a chain reaction of purchases. Many human behaviors follow the cycle. You often decide what to do next based on what you have just finished doing. Going to the bathroom leads to washing and drying your hands, which reminds you that you need to put the dirty towels in the laundry. So you add detergent to the shopping list. And so on. No behavior happens in isolation. Each and every action becomes a cue, becomes that thing that triggers you, that triggers the next behavior. Why is this so important? We will stop there. Yeah. Oh my God, thank you for this. I've been wanting to get this, but haven't haven't had a chance to get it. This book, are you talking about this book? Atomic Habits, that's the name of the book. That is the name of the book. Do you guys have any questions? When is the next one? Uh, you will have to check my profile for the next one. It might be mm, Friday. If not Friday, it will definitely be Monday. But I do two lives a week. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. I am so happy to hear that. I really hope my main reason to continue doing live is because of the positive reaction, positive feedback that I get from everyone. But most importantly is the fact that someone out there is learning something. And that's the, that is my whole goal on TikTok, on social media, um, creating a positive impact because there's so much negative impact. There's so much negativity going around on like TikTok and stuff. So I am so grateful that I have the opportunity and I have a voice to share what I what I know or share what I have. So, um, do you guys have any questions? Then I appreciate all the positive, all the positive um, comments and everyone, everyone that's like here is so nice. Except that one person that said Oprah Winfrey died which was fake news, but it was so funny. <laughs> I think sometimes people look for so much attention, so they do anything for it, which is not good. But other than that, everyone is so nice. Where do you from? The correct answer is, where are you from? Do you teach private lessons? Yes, I teach private lessons, actually. Um, if you want more information, message me on Instagram and I'll give you more information. Uh, like uh, 
Yeah. How much does it cost to have a lesson? Uh, message me on Instagram. I'll give you more information. Uh, what chapter are you in? We are in chapter 5. We just stopped at chapter 5. And the next one, I will put the event. So like I said, I will put the event, the time and date on my profile. So tomorrow sometime, if you check my Instagram. Uh, no, not my Instagram. If you check my TikTok, there will be the event for the next live and and uh, you can click on it so that you will get a reminder once i do the live so uh, thank you for reading for us or reading to us you are very welcome how much is this book this book in america is apparently $27, but I'm pretty sure that you can find it for $20 or $15 on eBay. It's called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Yeah. So, um, but um, it's a really good book. You can find on Amazon for 13 euros. See, I told you. I'm pretty sure they have... Um, they have cheaper you can find it cheaper and even at the local uh, bookstore you can find it cheaper um, any other questions uh, somebody said what is your wh where where are you from i live in the united states but i'm originally from the middle east i'm from kurdistan in northern iraq do we have anyone from kurdistan do we have anyone from iraq how many pages do you you only read bestsellers? No. No. I read I read any book that um I read any book that I I learn from. So I read uh, different kinds of books. I don't read too much. I like to read biographies. I will show you another book that I am reading. And that book makes you almost cry. I will be right back. <sighs> wow. I am about to finish this book when breath becomes air, but depending on your English level, because it's written by a uh neuroscientist or a uh, neurosurgeon it's a very very sad book very very sad book i will tell you that but it's a biography of dr paul kalanithi it made me cry because uh, i will spoil one part well he talks about it in the beginning the author who uh, the person like the author is paul kalanithi he gets cancer and he dies before he finishes the book so um so it talks about his life and how his whole future crushes whenever he's diagnosed with cancer so it's a really really good book when so I don't I know I don't only read self or bestsellers. I read books. Um yeah, I read books that I can learn from. And the more books you read, um the more books you read, the better your life becomes. Death shouldn't be something sad. I love that because I agree. I think we have to become very comfortable with death because one day we are going to to leave this earth. One day we're going to die. And the more you become comfortable with the idea of death, um, the more action, the better actions you take in your life. Because we're all going to die one day and... 
we're not going to be here anymore. So why should I waste my life? Right? So, but people in the West actually don't talk about death a lot because it's, it's something that scares them. So they try not to uh, talk or think about death much, but death is good to think about. Yeah. Uh, what else? What do you think about bestsellers? Can you add text and podcast while you speak? You can, uh, can you add the text and podcast while you speak? No, you can only do that on YouTube. And I will add, uh, I have my next thing is I will add video podcasts to YouTube. So if you subscribe to my, if you check out my YouTube, I will start making more videos to my pod, like the audio lessons. I will put them on my YouTube and they will have text. And it'll be the same lessons that you find on my podcast. The links are all in the... Um, the le- <clears throat> I need water. What are your podcasts about? My podcast is about learning English. Learning English, motivation. So I have all the lessons for practicing English. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you guys have any other questions? I think you should do, you should read in live on Instagram. I will try to do that. I've never done it on Instagram, so I don't know the response. Is the the habit one a bestseller? Uh, yes, it's a bestseller. What's my YouTube? Find a link in my profile. It's called The English Zone. But all my links to my YouTube, to my WhatsApp group, to my Instagram, to my podcast, they're all in my profile. How did you learn English? By listening. Listening, listening, listening. And of course, I went to college. So I have all my respect and admiration for all my college professors who taught me English. But the best method is to uh, listen. Do you read also old philosophy books? I don't like boring books. Anything I don't like. So old philosophy books, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like if you're if you mean like Shakespeare and stuff like that, probably not. What's the best way to practice English in non-English country? Listening, listening, listening. Uh, and... Uh, if you don't have friends, this is something else that this book, Atomic Habits, talks about. is surround yourself that have similar behaviors. And we will get to that part. But surround yourself with similar behaviors. So if you can find people who practice English or want to speak English, join those groups. Um, whether online or um or in person, find people who want to practice English and practice with them. But the best way I will say is listening. I learned English even before I came to the United States. So, and I know a lot of people in the US who do not speak. They have been in the US for 10 years and they don't speak any English. So just because you live in an English speaking country does not mean that you can speak English because you get you get busy with work and maybe you don't make the effort to learn English and then uh, you just hang out with people from your country from the same culture then you think it's not um it's not necessary to learn English so did you did you read Said Norsi he's Kurdish too no I have not but I know him, of course, because I'm Kurdish. You should read books on your podcast. I would love to hear them. Thank you very much, Adric. Uh, I will consider that, actually. The thing about reading books on a podcast is because of copyright. So I must find books that are free of copyright. And they also have to be good books. And I will read it on my podcast. And if are you subscribed to my podcast? If you are, then I will definitely consider that. 
Atomic Habits was the most useless book I've ever read. Sorry if this is offensive. No, it's not offensive. Uh, it helped me. So for each, for each person, I always say there is no best book. There is no, everything is perspective. It wasn't useful to you, but it was useful to me. Um, everything is perspective in life. Which English language books are good to improve English? I actually don't know. I mostly focus on listening and websites. It's been a while that I have read a book for teaching English. You should read books on your own. Oh, what else do we have? What's remarkable? Remarkable means amazing or noticeable. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, guys? Any podcast you recommend? Yes. Effortless English. That's one of the best podcasts you can uh, follow. Or you can listen to Effortless English by AJ Hogue. Effortless English. Effortless English. And of course, my podcast too. It's the best one. <laughs> I'm joking. How do you find people who behave the way you want to achieve to behave? How do you find people who behave the way you want to achieve the behavior? Um, well, I think that's a really good question. Um, what you have to do is only surround yourself with similar behavior. So if you hang out with people that are not the same that don't have the same behavior then try to reduce your time with them and focus on yourself but expose yourself go out make friends go to seminars go to events and if you find people that behave similarly let's say you go play soccer and there are a couple people that you're like oh we can be friends and they are nice people then try to make friends with those people and then develop those habits. Just because you have been friends with someone for 10 years does not mean you should stay forever if that friend does not uh, benefit and does not bring uh, like good wellness and goodness to your life. So I'm reading this book. Yeah, that's good. Podcast. What's Effortless English? The name of the podcast? Yeah, so if you go to Spotify and just uh, type Effortless English Podcast, you will find that podcast. If you also type The English Zone, you will find my podcast. So, yeah, hang out with people who have the same interest. How can I get vocabulary? Reading. Reading and listening. I'm just reading this book. It's amazing. That's good. Um, yeah, reading reading stories. Like for me, if I'm reading a book and uh, there are new vocabulary words, uh, I highlight it. I look up the dictionary, write the meaning. Well, in the past. I don't do it anymore because my English... I understand most things, but I'm still learning new vocabulary words. People watching this live, let's be friends. I have a face. Uh, I have a WhatsApp group actually for people to practice English. It's free, but you must be polite and respect other people's privacy. If you are interested, that's also a place you can probably practice your English and make connections with people from around the world. The link is in my profile. You can join and it's free, but if you join and then you don't respect other people's privacy, you will be removed from the group. So respect is key, yep. Um, you cannot text people in private. If you do and you get reported, you'll be removed. So, yeah, but feel free to join, guys. There's a lot of people from so many different countries. Like I said, link is in bio. 
jumped on your podcast on Spotify just now. Very nice. The Angler Zone. That is the name of my podcast. Uh, yeah, we just finished reading this. We ju- I just stopped reading. We didn't finish it. HW.W. I was reading for an hour and a half and uh, we just stopped right here on page 73 and on my next live i will do i will continue so all right guys thank you so much for joining i appreciate you and i hope you enjoyed this live like i said feel free to message me if you have any questions about english courses uh, online courses or if you have a question feel free to message me on instagram It's a biography. Yes. All right, guys. Have a great night. If it's nighttime there, if it's the daytime, have a great day. And I appreciate you for joining. And uh, yeah, this is the left book. How many years did it take you to learn English? A couple years. Have a good day, guys. Thank you so much for joining. I'll see you in the next live.